Hello and welcome to History Fool. Today we are going to dive into Henry VIII and the executions that he had carried out. Henry VIII is well known for his six wives, but he's also well known for the many, many executions that he authorized during his reign. He reigned for 36 years and during that time he authorized approximately 57,000 executions. That is roughly four executions per day for 36 years. Um, so today we will look at a few of those executions, the more interesting ones, because unfortunately being hung or beheaded with an axe was a nice execution. There were some really, really quite horrific ways to execute people that Henry VIII um, employed. And so I want to have a look at a few of those. The first victim of Henry VIII that I want to talk about is Richard Ruse the Cook. And he was boiled alive. His story is quite interesting and fairly unique, I think, because being boiled alive wasn't the traditional way of being executed. And it was quite extreme for the crime in which he committed. So. Let's get started and have a look at some pictures and learn about his story some more. Richard Ruse was the cook for John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester. He was accused of poisoning the household by placing some powder into the meal that he was preparing. The meal was then served to members of the household as well as to two beggars. Everyone in the house became violently ill and the two beggars died. Richard Ruse, however, did not become ill at all as he had decided not to eat that night. There are a few theories on why he didn't eat, such as he was fasting, or that he was well known not to eat until everyone else had finished and those who regularly came begging for food were supplied with a meal. He was also well known for being charitable to those who had far less than he did. Now at the time the bishop was not in Henry VIII's good graces. Bishop Fisher had vehemently opposed the annulment of his marriage from Catherine of Aragon and wholeheartedly did not approve of his new marriage to Anne Boleyn. Many thought that Anne Boleyn or her family were to blame suggesting that someone from her family had bribed Richard Ruse to poison the bishop's food in order to be rid of him. Although there was much ado about poisoning back in the Tudor times with elaborate tasting ceremonies and official tasters, it was actually rather rare for food to be poisoned. It was far more common to come down with regular old food poisoning from ill-prepared meats just like we experience in this day and age. There is no proof to suggest that Anne Boleyn was involved in this case at all. Ruse was arrested and taken to the Tower of London where he was interrogated by Thomas Cromwell. He did allegedly say that he only put laxatives in the meal, that it was supposed to be a joke or a prank. He refused to say who paid him and was subsequently sentenced to death by being boiled alive. He was not even given a trial. It was such an unprecedented sentence for someone who was of no notable position or significance, a common criminal if that. Now the process of being boiled alive is gruesome. It was so horrific that it was later deemed illegal by Henry VIII's son, Edward VI. The person would be either placed in a vat of cold liquid or oil and slowly heated until boiling. It was 100% a method of execution that you used if you wanted someone to truly suffer before death. It can take hours before you die. The method of torture is unique in that you are conscious for most of it. This process takes a long time for your body to actually go into shock. First, the outer layers of your skin will begin to cook. Eventually, all the liquid in your body will boil, cooking your organs to perfection. You will literally be able to smell yourself cooking while being conscious the entire time. Once your nerve endings are burnt, you will lose the feeling of pain, but up until that point, the pain will be indescribable. The torturous death that Richard Ruse went through was indescribably cruel. There really are no words for the way in which he was put to death. It is no wonder that it was outlawed. Unfortunately, England was not the only place this method of torture was carried out. All over the world it has been a method to teach people a lesson and inflict intense suffering on their fellow men. Thinking about Richard Ruse being put in that vat of water or oil, whatever they used, and then slowly being brought up to temperature and boiled, it just sounds horrific. It makes my body like cringe just thinking about it. Because when you are boiled alive, I am imagining, I've never been boiled alive, but I imagine that your brain is doing everything it can to try and preserve you and because you don't put your head under the water or anything like that so you can't just drown yourself or so you're fully conscious right up to like the last minute and it's one of the unique things is that your body doesn't go into shock it takes a long long time to go into shock and they've learned that from people who have like fallen in, fallen into hot springs and things that they are still fully conscious and fully aware even though their body is like practically cooked they are still like conscious when they've pulled them out and they die shortly after but they're still 100% conscious and oh that just 
is horrifying to think about because you know there's no way out. People try and, will be trying to climb out I imagine. Like did he just sit there in the water waiting to die? I don't know. I would be trying to like climb out if I was him. So if, <clears throat> there we have the story about Richard Ruse. I would really like to know a bit more information about that. I'd like to know how many of these executions actually happened. Like how many boiling alive's how common was it because usually when you think of an execution it's usually they get hung or they uh, are executed on like a, an axe or something like that but i want to know how many people were really boiled alive under king henry VIII's rule next up is anne askew and she is a personal hero and favorite of mine if you've ever watched the tudors series you will know why because she endured such horrific circumstances in the name of her faith and she just never ever backed down and she never um she never implicated anybody else in her suffering they tortured her so badly and she just stood her ground and they finally gave up torturing her because they just knew that she was not going to back down and in the end they had her executed and she was burned at the stake and that is another way that is pretty horrific to die i would rather be executed on the chopping block to be honest so i would like to share with you the story about anne askew and her final moments anne askew she was a woman of so much courage and strength Anne was a martyr for her faith. Although Henry VIII had broken away from the Catholic Church in order to marry Anne Boleyn, he still kept much of the Catholic beliefs and now being the head of the church, he was vehemently against anyone who thought or preached differently to what he believed. Anne Askew was bold and brave. She preached her Protestant faith without fear. She was arrested multiple times before the final time where she was taken to the Tower of London and tortured in a futile effort to have her name and others who had similar beliefs to her. Her torture in the tower was wholly illegal, however Stephen Gardner, Thomas Friothsley and Richard Rich, who were council members, were determined to get information from her and ordered Kingston, the constable of the tower, to attach her to the rack, a medieval torture device. Even when threatened with the rack, she would not recant or divulge any information to the councilman. Kingston was horrified at what he was being asked to do. As Anne lay on the rack, Kingston turned the wheels and although in immense pain, Anne still refused to talk. It was all too much for Kingston. Knowing full well that what was occurring was wrong, unfair, cruel and illegal, he left to seek out the king. Anne's torture did not end there. The councillors removed their robes and continued to turn the wheel themselves, dislocating all of her bones as they pulled her body further and further apart. She still did not speak a word against any other person. Realising that their efforts were futile against this mighty woman, they took her to a private house to recover, but her injuries were so severe that it was of no use. She was soon sentenced to death by being burned at the stake. On the day of her execution, she could not walk and had to be carried on a chair to the place. She was delirious with pain after having her limbs almost ripped from her body. She was tied to the stake and the fire lit below her. In the series The Tudors, Anne had a bundle of gunpowder placed around her neck. This was often done as a way to quicken the death. The gunpowder would ignite and kill the person almost immediately. Not all who were executed in this manner were so lucky. You would usually have to have someone pay the person who was in charge of lighting the fires to place the gunpowder on the person. It is not certain if this actually happened to Anne, but I really hope it did. She had been through so much pain and torture and a quick death would have been such a blessing. You can tell from Anne Askew's story why she was one of my favourite heroes, or why she is one of my favourite heroes. She was a woman of so much faith and so much power. And no matter what anybody did to her, they were literally pulling her limbs from her body and she still did not deny her faith and she did not give up anybody, um, anybody else. She was obviously a very, very loyal friend and a devout Christian and so devout to her faith. I think maybe she knew or at least she believed that this life was not the end, that there was something beyond this life and that that was something that she was willing to fight for and willing to pay with her life for. Um, being burned at the stake is not a nice way to go. It is long and tortuous. It can take up to two hours before you actually succumb to the smoke and the fire itself. Um, it is just really a horrible way to die and it is something that I guess they used if they wanted to torture someone even if torture them a bit more. I really hope that someone had placed the gunpowder around her neck like they portrayed in the Tudors um, because that would have just made it so much nicer for her, as nice as death can be when you're being killed. Um, but being not having to endure 
the torture for any longer than was absolutely necessary. That is just, would have just been so wonderful for her and I hope that is what happened. All right, let's move on to our next person. Our next victim of Henry VIII is Thomas Johnson, who was a monk and he was convicted of denying that Henry VIII was the supreme leader of the church. He didn't really do anything wrong. What's really sad is these monks, they used to just live by themselves. They didn't go out preaching or anything like that. They were just very insular and just kept to themselves. But Henry VIII, he didn't really care anybody who was going to deny him. He was going to track down and find and try them. Henry VIII actually got really annoyed at Thomas Johnson because he took so long to die. And I don't know why he didn't just execute him in a normal manner, why starvation was such a method that he used because it seems very strange. Um, Henry VIII, he liked to kill a lot of people. Like, I don't know why he chose starvation in particular for the monks. So let's have a look at some pictures and learn about the monks, in particular Thomas Johnson. Thomas Johnson was a monk during Henry VIII's reign. He was, at the time of his death, a Carthusian hermit. If you are unsure of what that is, let me explain. The Carthusian were a Latin sect of the Catholic Church who isolated themselves from the outside world. This included both nuns and monks. The hermit refers to a person living in seclusion. So essentially, Thomas Johnson was a Catholic monk who lived his life in seclusion away from the general public and outside world. In 1537, Johnson and other members of the London Charter House, which was at the time a Carthusian priory, were arrested and taken into custody. They had all refused to sign the Oath of Supremacy. This was a document that declared that the reigning monarch, who was Henry VIII at the time, as the head of the church. Failing to sign this document was seen as treason against the king and punishable by death. Johnson and the others he was arrested with were taken to Newgate Prison and left to starve. Death by starvation was a long process and could take weeks before you finally succumbed to death. While he was incarcerated, he was visited by Margaret Clement, who was a devout Catholic and spent much of her time secretly delivering food to those Carthusian monks who were imprisoned. Henry VIII was growing weary of why the monks were taking so long to die, and he ordered that all visits stop. Eventually, his fellow monks passed away, but he was the last to die. This was, perhaps, because he was finally allowed food, as it was thought that he would be executed in some other manner. Unfortunately, food again was withdrawn, and this time it finally took his life. I am so thankful that I live in a country and in a day and age where I can practice my faith without fear. That I can go to church, I can do whatever I want to do in relation to my faith and I'm not necessarily going to get persecuted for it. I don't need a fear for my life or anything like that. These Carthusian monks, they were a very private um, sect and they didn't go out, they weren't out preaching or protesting against the king or anything like that. They lived in seclusion away from other people. They weren't harming anybody with their beliefs or what they were doing and I just find it so cruel and unhumane and just nasty what Henry VIII did to them. He was such a powerful king who just used his power for evil and not good. I feel like if you were a leader you should use that power for good and to bless other people and what he did was neither of those things. He just ruled with an iron fist and he did not care for anyone else other than himself and even his closest friends he eventually had executed which was horrible who does that um, it just shows what a horrible person that he was we are now going to move on to the most horrific means of torture known to man I think it is just horrible there are not uh, there needs to be bigger words for how horrible it is if you have some better words for how horrible it is let me know because all I can think is horrible gruesome ghastly and inhumane I don't know there needs to be big words. I need to go look in a thesaurus, I think. That ultimate punishment has been hung, drawn, and courted. And if you wanted somebody dead and you wanted the world to know that what they were doing was wrong and to make a statement, this was how you did it. Being hung, drawn, and courted. This method of execution was made infamous in modern times with the mighty William Wallace in Braveheart. I remember watching it as a child, which now looking back on it was probably not the most appropriate movie for a seven year old. However, it left its mark on me and I have never been able to watch it again though. Henry VIII had multiple people endure this ridiculous death in the name of treason against him. 
Been hung, drawn and quartered was a long, drawn out process. It seems that all the worst ways to die involve an extended period of torture and humiliation. If you were an English king and you were terrified of someone coming to take over your throne, you would likely want to come up with a punishment that was so sadistic and so obscene that only the truly insane would ever think about ousting you. That is exactly how being hung, drawn and quartered came about. Here is the exact text from an English law book. That you shall be drawn on a hurdle to the place of execution, where you shall be hanged by the neck, and being alive, cut down. Your privy members shall be cut off, and your bowels taken out, and burned before you. Your head severed from your body, and your body divided into four quarters to be disposed of at the king's pleasure. You would have to be absolutely mad to even consider going up against the king and having that as a repercussion if you did not succeed. The drawing part comes first, where you are unceremoniously, or ceremoniously, as there is usually a crowd out to watch the event unfold, drawn on a sleigh type device behind a horse. This journey was roughly three hours long from Newgate Prison in London to Tyburn, just outside the city. Tyburn was notoriously known for the sheer number of executions performed there. Along the way, there would be crowds of people jeering and throwing all manner of rubbish at the victim. Once at the execution site, the person would then be tied by his neck and hung from the gallows just enough that he would be almost dead, but not quite. At this point, knowing what was to come, the most gruesome and stomach churning part of the experience. The victim would then be lowered from the hanging rope and laid in front of the crowd. His privy members were cut off, meaning his genitals, and thrown into a roaring fire. If that was not enough, his body was then cut open while he was still alive from his groin up to his sternum and his intestines pulled out. You would honestly hope that by this point you are either dead or at the very least lost consciousness. To finally ensure the death of the person, the heart was cut from their chest and thrown into the fire. The next part of this horrific saga was more as a warning to others and a bit of a publicity stunt. The head was removed from the body and the body quartered which essentially meant the arms and legs were removed. After the removal of these body parts, they were preserved in a multitude of spices and then paraded around the country to let people know exactly what happens to people who defy the king. The head was usually speared and displayed on the London Bridge or Tower of London as a warning. Can you imagine just going for your regular morning walk in London, past London Bridge, past the Tower of London, and just seeing all these speared heads hanging out for you? It sounds absolutely absurd in this day and age, but it was pretty common back then, especially with the number of executions that Henry VIII signed off on. There was probably executions every day. Actually, I don't know if they had them all on a Saturday, for example, or if they just did them every single day. Um, can you imagine if they just saved them up till the weekend and just lined you up for execution, execution, execution? That would be insane. But it was just like going to watch the football on a Saturday afternoon, I guess. Um, they were just so common that that's what you did. There's nothing to do at home. Oh, let's go see what's happening in the town square. Let's go watch some executions today. Um, I'm sure some of these executions might have been warranted, I guess. But a lot of them were just, um, the people weren't even guilty. They were just people that Henry VIII didn't like. Or the things that they were guilty for should not be, have been punished like that. I can't imagine being set on fire or... Um, <sighs> being decapitated or hung because of what I believed in or because I just didn't think the same as the Prime Minister or something like that. It just seems so horrible and this is the thing that people live with in that day. But I'm so thankful that we live now and I feel so sorry for those people who had to endure the reign of Henry VIII, especially if they weren't on his good side and even if they were on his good side and they were like close to him, you would not want to step a foot out of line. Like you just wanted to live in the country well away from him well away from anything that was happening so you could just stay out of the limelight you just did not want to be in the limelight just live in the country with your sheep and your pigs and your cows um so that is the stories for today i hope you enjoyed it and i am looking forward to seeing you back next time